Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a practical top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 helpful hints about doing good works. The Lord Jesus and his first century followers were known both for the good news and for good works. In fact, Paul says we should be careful to maintain good works, but what are the best ways to do this? Are there dangers we should avoid? How does this help the gospel? Today, people often think of Christians as judgmental, narrow-minded, holier than thou, and perhaps one way we can win friends of the world for Jesus is through good works. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now, good works, this has been big in this last little chapter, our move here to Mississippi. And so really excited about this list and this part of your growing and learning here. So number one, good works should manifest our Father's character. When we do good works, our grand objective is to introduce them to the goodness of God. And the scripture says the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So when people feel the sense of indebtedness to God, they sometimes long for a relationship themselves with God. When they see God answering our prayer, meeting our needs, they long for that themselves. So Matthew 5.16, famous verse says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, they get the family connection, right? We are acting like our Father. Jesus kept telling them that. My Father, this is, these are my Father's works, right? And so we need to be careful that people don't just think, well, we're nice religious people. And that's why we do these things. Instead of saying, no, it's the Father who wants me to do this. You give him the credit. I'm just the delivery boy. This is all from him. So if we're going to represent the Father, then we have to give the way the Father gives. He gives freely, gives generously, gives faithfully. I can't sort of do this drive-by charity. I show up once and then they never see me again. So the Father wants a relationship. He doesn't want to be a heavenly vending machine. And we shouldn't want that either. We're not just there to meet the particular need. We're there to introduce people to the Father. That's the, that's the goal. Number two, they should be Christ-like. We read in Acts 10.38, he went about doing good. A lot of what Jesus did was merely doing good for people. He used good works as an apologetic. He said, many good works I've shown you from my Father, for which of these works do you stone me? In John chapter 10. He's saying, look, you have evidence before you of the character of God, right? My works taste like God. You're going to have to deal with that. This is evidence of the goodness of God in the goodness that we manifest. And so we don't give to meet needs alone. We don't give just so that we feel useful. We're giving to connect them with Christ to remind them that he was the one who fed the multitudes, he was the one who healed the sick, and that he's standing by. He wants to be their best friend too, not just to be like the government meeting needs, but to be a personal friend. And so we need to be Christ-like in the way we do this. They didn't always appreciate Jesus. They took advantage of him. They stayed for dinner one night, maybe 25,000 people. Nobody invited him home. They treated him like a servant when we serve, they won't always appreciate us. They won't always say thank you. But that's not our objective. So we don't want to enable people's bad habits, but we do want to show the heart of Christ towards people. Number three, they should taste like the fruit of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God who works through us to produce this fruit. So they should be motivated by love. They should be done with joy, not grudgingly. 
Uh, they should make for peace. People should be drawn together by it and so on. We can go through the various aspects of the fruit of the Spirit and see how they should be revealed. If we don't have the right motive, we'll get bitter when we're taken for granted. So I can't be doing this for what I get out of this. I'm seeking to put into people's lives something from heaven and allowing it to have its effect, not the other way around. Much giving in the city because of the university is done so the giver feels good. But what we're doing is to do good to the recipient, not to ourselves. Number four, they should stir up love and provoke good works among other believers. And that's Hebrews 10, 24, isn't it? Let us consider one another in order to stir up. The King James uses the word provoke. It's really the word paroxysm. There's a disease called trigeminal neuralgia, paroxysmal trigeminal neuralgia, where even a little sunlight or chewing of food can trigger the action of the nerves in the face and cause it to move. And so Paul uses this word to describe the stimulus that we provide to other believers to make them want to do good works as well. It should be contagious, right? We promote them, notice, to love and good works. So that good works is not a mere obligation. It's, it's the outflow of love. That love, as the poet said, has a hem to its garment that reaches the very dust. It reaches the stains of the streets and lanes, and because it can, it must. So the idea is that love goes out of its way, goes to the poor, goes to the disadvantaged, not because of some sense of mere obligation, but out of love, the overflow of the love of God. I've got too much love, I've got to share it. Then, number five, good works fulfill God's purpose in our lives. One of those shocking verses that we need to drive home to ourselves and one that spoke in deep conviction to me because I'd always heard that good works was a bad thing. Right? Good works is filthy rags. It can't save you. It's true that we can't work our way to heaven, but we should work on our way to heaven. The good works is not the means of being saved, but it should be one of the results, one of the evidences of being saved. And so one verse that really spoke to my heart was, Titus 2, verses 13 and 14, looking for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us so that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people zealous for good works. I got the first half. I knew that he died to redeem me from all iniquity, but he wants to replace the negative actions pictured in this idea of iniquity, self-willed lawlessness, he wants to replace those with good works, right? So Paul says, let him that stole steal no more, but let him work with his hands the thing that's good, so he's got enough to pay his bills and enough left over to give to those in need. God takes thieves and turns them into philanthropists. So God doesn't just want me not to do bad things, he wants me positively to do good things. And it's one of the reasons, one of God's purposes in my life, not that I might grudgingly do good works, but be zealous of good works, saying, I'm looking for opportunities. I want to be used in this way. Then number six, they distinguish believers from hypocrites. That's a good one, isn't it? We read that in Paul's little letter to Titus, chapter 1. To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified from every good work. People will know whether you're a really or a phony by the way you do good works. If you're not interested in the credit, if you actually want to know how the people themselves are doing. You're not superficial in the thing. If you come back and don't just skip out on them and leave them in the lurch, 
they pick this up pretty quickly and they know you're the real thing. And so a hypocrite may appear to do good works, but they're doing it for the wrong motives. And people can pick up pretty quickly if you're doing it to get your picture in the paper or to get your name on the plaque or if you're just doing it for the good of others. Number seven, they should be intentional, not incidental. This is not something, an accident, like a homeless man comes up to me and says, I haven't eaten for three days, can you give me, give me a couple bucks for something to eat? And I grudgingly give it to them. That's not the idea here. Titus 2.7 says, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, or as Paul says, to be rich in good works. I remember Grace Pell, she ran a Bible bookstore in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and had many people coming in looking for a handout. So she had little cards printed up, and on one side it said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And on the other side, there was an offer for a free lunch at a local diner. And she had arranged with the diner, they could go in, get a bowl of soup, a sandwich, a piece of pie, and a cup of coffee, and she'd pick up the cost at the end of the week. She only had two or three of all the hundreds of cards she gave out, two or three who actually took her up on it. So the scripture says, give to him that asks. It doesn't say give him what he asks. So if some children said, we want some money so we can go to a McDonald's restaurant when we're on a school trip, I might say to them what I said to my own children. Here's a rake and there's an acre of leaves. You go rake leaves and I'll pay you good pay and then you can have some money. So I want them to learn good life skills and I don't want simply to hand out charity, but I want to do good as well. So I need to be wise in this. There needs to be spiritual discernment along with my good works, but at the same time I should have a pattern in my life of doing good. I should be the guy who goes up to the homeless man and says, hey, let's have lunch, what do you say? And start talking to them and ask them questions about their life and where they grew up and the difficulties of their lives and to pray with them and develop a relationship. These are real people. And these are the kind of people that hung around with Jesus. If I hold up the gospel banner, I'm going to attract those kind of people and I have to be prepared so I don't enable their bad habits. If they're asking for money for liquor or cigarettes, probably not a good idea. But I want to help them and minister to them. And one of the best ways is to take them out for lunch and have lunch together. So yeah, develop a pattern of good works. That's a great thing to do. Number eight, they should require preparation of our inner man and our resources. It's good to be spontaneous. But being spontaneous very often involves being prepared beforehand. So if I want to, for example, a waitress, I find out she's having a time struggling, she's had time off work, and she's had some debts mounted up, and I want to give her $20 or even $50 for a tip, that's not by accident. I have to go prepared. And so the scripture says in Titus 3, 1 and 2, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. To be peaceable, gentle, show all humility to all men. So, you know, you look at this list and you see sort of the five fingers on a workman's hand. To be subject to authority, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, not to be speaking evil of anyone, to be peaceable and gentle and showing humility. So my attitude is very important. If I'm superior, I speak down, I criticize people, and then I try to do good works, it's not gonna happen. If I cut off people on the road and then I find out that they can't afford their groceries at the Kroger store, it's pretty hard to step in then and to show a gracious attitude. So I need to be consistent in my life. I need to be thoughtful and careful and kind and patient with people and if I am, then I'll have opportunities to do good. Number nine, our works require careful maintenance and wise choices. Again, it goes back to this idea, if I'm going to do good, then there are things that I'm not going to do. This is a faithful saying, Paul writes to Titus in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. This is a faithful saying, and those 
things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they're unprofitable and useless. Now, I work among a certain group of people who perhaps have a very different view of law and order. In Mississippi, one out of every three black males ends up in the prison system. That means that every poor black family I work with probably has someone in prison. And they may look at things quite differently than I do. They would think about the presidents in a different way than I might. And if I get involved in political arguing with them, I lose my base. They don't trust me. And so I need to be really careful. Do I want to make people think I'm clever or Jesus is wonderful? Because I can't do both at the same time. And these are the choices we make. That if I'm going to be a faithful servant and be involved in good works in the community, I have to stay away from what he calls here foolish disputes, contentions, strivings, and so on. I need to stay away from that and say, look, I'm going to keep my focus. I'm here to do good and to speak good. I want to bring good news to people and I want to do good works. And these are the two handmaidens that work together. People don't always appreciate my good news right away, but they appreciate my good works. And my good works opens the door to speaking the good news. People know I care about them. And so they take seriously what I say. And then finally, number 10, our works are directly linked to fruitfulness. That's, that's an important idea, isn't it? Again, Titus chapter 3 and verse 14, let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent need, that they may not be unfruitful. This goes back to this idea, do people know I care? Paul's closing exhortation to the elders at Miletus, the elders from Ephesus. He says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it's more blessed to give than receive. Now, there's no record of that in the four Gospels. But it was such a well-known phrase. Everybody seemed to know this. You know, it's hard for Christians to believe this. Are you telling me? that uh, I have money saved up to buy a new car and I can just taste it, I can smell the leather. I just love the nice chink of the door, no rattles and no rust spots. And what a great thing to have this new car, how happy I would be with this new car. And all of a sudden I hear about a missionary family that have had to leave suddenly from the field and they're back and they don't have transportation. Are you telling me that if I took that money that I'd saved up for a new car and I went and bought a van for this family to get around as missionaries, that it'd be more blessing to me, that I'd be happier about that than driving around in my own car? Well, try it. you find out it's true. It's more blessed to give than receive. The scripture says, as poor yet making many rich. Now, it doesn't say we are poor, but we live frugally and we give generously. If that's the pattern of our life, to live frugally, and give generously, then we'll reap the benefits of those words. It's more blessed to give than receive. So, do people know I care? If they don't know I care, it's hard for them to listen to the gospel. But if I do, they will offer opportunities to speak in the gospel. Now, I don't link my good works and my good news. I do good works and I share good news. But I let them put the two together. If I go into a situation and say, if I do this for you, will you let me preach? They say, we're not for sale. This is mercenary. You're trying to trick me. You're trying to buy my conversion. So I just do the good works, and this is where faith comes in. I trust God to give me the opportunity. Jesus fed the multitude. End of story. No, not the end of the story. The end of the chapter. It's not till they come back the next day that he introduces the gospel. He gives them the opportunity. They receive freely the meal, and then they come back the next day. And now Jesus says, well, now I've got something else to talk about. So it's good for us to do that, that we don't end up giving the impression that we're mercenary and we're trying to buy converts. If we do our good works and trust God 
so that they come and say, by the way, would you pray for me? Would you help me with this? And all of a sudden the door opens for the gospel. I can tell you this, over the last eight years, doing good works in this community, never once have I tried to link the two, but never once have I done good works that God hasn't given me an opportunity for the gospel. So this is a pattern in scripture. God help us to be careful to maintain good works to see this as part of our lifestyle and looking for opportunities to do good to people and also asking God to give us an open door to share the gospel with these people where we've already shown that we care about them and then we have a chance to introduce to them a higher truth, a greater truth that God doesn't just want to give them groceries, he wants to give his son, he wants to give them eternal life.